Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are on a new book today. Uh, I've got one that's called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Um, it's a collection of three stories about Sherlock Holmes. And for those of you who don't know who Sherlock Holmes is, uh, he is a, a detective. And he is um, around in like the late 1800s like 1880, 1890, 1900. Um, and the author actually um, is named Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he um, was actually a doctor, like, you know, a medicine doctor. But um, not a lot of patients went to him. Maybe he was a bad doctor. I'm not sure. But in his free time, while he's waiting for patients to come, he was writing stories. Um, and he used a lot of the same skills that he would use to... Um, figure out what was wrong with someone, like the same detective skills, you could say, um, to uh, figure out crimes. And I think he actually solved some real crimes um, in real life. Um, anyway, so Sherlock Holmes is a very famous fictional uh, detective. He lives in England, and this first one is called The Red-Headed League. We might not get through the whole chapter for each of these stories in a day because they're pretty long, um, but we'll see how much time we've got, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. All right, so the first, the first mystery is called the Red-Headed League. As Dr. John Watson called on his friend, Mr. Holmes, one autumn day, he found the great detective deep in conversation with a very stout, red-faced, elderly gentleman with fiery red hair. Forgive me, Holmes, said Watson in the doorway. Watson is like um, uh, Sherlock Holmes' assistant. Not at all, said Holmes. Come in and close the door behind you. Then turning to his guest, the detective explained, Dr. Watson has helped me solve many of my most successful cases, and I have no doubt that he will be just as useful in helping me solve yours too, Mr. Wilson. The stout gentleman nodded as Dr. Watson and at Dr. Watson, as Sherlock Holmes sat back in his armchair, putting his fingertips together, as was his habit when he was in a thoughtful mood. After Dr. Watson had seated himself on the sofa, Holmes leaned forward and spoke. Mr. Jabez Wilson here has begun telling me a story which promises to be one of the most unusual I have heard in some time. I am quite certain that a crime has been committed but I want you to listen to the story from the beginning, Watson, right from Mr. Wilson's lips, and I'm sure you'll agree that I've never had a case quite like this before. Jabez Wilson pulled a dirty, wrinkled newspaper from his pocket and flattened it on his knee. It was a large page filled with classified ads. As Mr. Wilson ran his finger down one column, Watson took a few moments to study him, realizing full well how much he could learn about a man from his appearance. According to the methods Sherlock Holmes had taught him, Jabez Wilson's clothes revealed him to be an only average British tradesman, although the heavy-set vest chain with a piece of triangular metal hanging from it caught Watson's eye. But other than that, there was nothing remarkable about the man, except his blazing red hair and his expression of anger. Holmes noticed Watson studying their guests, and he smiled, except for the fact that Mr. Wilson has at time, some time done some man, manual labor, said Holmes, that he has been in China and that he has done a great deal of writing lately. I cannot discover anything else. Jabez Wilson looked up from his newspaper with a start. How in the name of heaven did you know all that, Mr. Holmes? He asked. It's true I once did manual labor. My first job was a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir, said Holmes. Your right hand is much larger than your left, and the muscles are more developed. But the writing, gasped Wilson. The right cuff on your jacket sleeve is shiny from rubbing along papers, explained Holmes, and the patch on your left elbow is smooth where you rest it on the desk. Ah, yeah, very observant. Amazing, cried Jabez Wilson, but how did you know I had been in China? The fish tattooed just above your right wrist could only have been done in China. I have made a thorough study of tattoos from around the world and can easily identify those from every country. And besides, the coin hanging from your watch chain is Chinese, too. Well, I never, said Jabez Wilson, laughing heartily. Now, to the business at hand, said Holmes. 
Have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Yes, I have it now, he answered, with his thick red finger planted halfway down the newspaper column. This is the ad that began it all. Just read it. Watson took the paper. Mr. Wilson reached out and began to read. Here's the newspaper ad. To the Red-Headed League, according to the terms of the will of the late Ezekiel Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, USA, the Red-Headed League was formed. Now there is room for one more member of the league with a salary of four pounds a week in return for very simple services. All red-headed men who are in good health and above the age of 21 are eligible for membership. Apply in person Monday at 11 a.m. to Duncan Ross at the league's office. 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street. When Wilson finished reading, he sat back puzzled. What on earth does this mean? He asked. Holmes chuckled. A bit odd, isn't it? He said. Then turning to Jabez Wilson, Holmes continued. And now, sir, tell us about yourself, your household, and what has happened to you since this ad. Strange ad, huh? A red-headed league? Like a group of people who are just like in a group because they've got red hair? Weird. Yes, Mr. Holmes, said Jabez Wilson. Since that day, the ad appeared in the Morning Chronicle on April 27, 1890. Only two months ago, my life has been strangely changed. Well, to begin, I have a small pawnbroker shop on Coburg Square here in London, but it's not a very large business, and it's just about provides me with a living. I used to have two assistants, but now I only keep one. It would have been hard enough to pay him, but he was willing to come and work with me at half pay in order to learn the business. What is the name of this ambitious young man? asked Holmes. Vincent Spaulding, replied Wilson, and he's not much of a young man either. It's hard to guess his age, but I couldn't ask for a smarter assistant. He surely could better himself and learn more than what I pay him, but he seems satisfied, so why should I give him any ideas? You seem fortunate in having such an unusual assistant, said Holmes. Yeah, who would want to work for half pay? That seems odd. Why would he want to do that? Spaulding has his faults, too, said Mr. Wilson. Always with his hobby, but photography, snapping away with the camera, then diving down into the cellar to develop his pictures. But aside from this fault, on the whole, he's a good worker. He lives with you, too? asked Holmes. Yes, he and a woman who does simple cooking and cleaning. I'm a widower, meaning his wife died, Mr. Holmes and never had a family. The three of us live very quietly. Anyways, it was Spaulding who brought the Chronicle into my office just eight weeks ago today. Spaulding handed me the paper and said, I wish to God, Mr. Wilson, that I was a red-headed man. Why is that? I asked. Because there's another vacancy in the red-headed league, he said eagerly. It's worth quite a fortune to any man who gets it. If my hair could only change color, I could probably be set for life. "'What's this league, Spaulding?' I asked. "'Haven't you heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men?' he asked, surprised. "'Never,' I replied. "'That's odd,' he said, "'for you, yourself, are eligible to become a member.' "'And what does a member do?' I asked. "'Some slight work which doesn't interfere with his other occupations, "'and for it he earns a couple hundred pounds a year, "'which in, in that back then would have been a lot. "'And in England, they call their dollar or their money that they use the pound, "'so it's like saying a couple hundred dollars a year.' Well, Mr. Holmes, that made me prick up my ears, for, as I told you, business hasn't been all that good these last few years, and that extra couple hundred pounds would come in handy. So I took the newspaper from Spaulding and read the ad. Then I asked him what he knew of his red-headed league. Mr. Wilson, he said, from what I know, the league was founded by an American millionaire, Ezekiah Holmes, or maybe it's Ezekiah Holmes. No, Ezekiah Hopkins, sorry. Ooh who was a bit peculiar in his ways. He himself was red-headed, and he had a great sympathy for all red-headed men. So upon his death, his enormous fortune was left in the hands of trustees with instructions to use the interest to help all red-headed men. But there must be millions of red-headed men who would apply for membership in the league, I told Spaulding. Not as many as you might think, he answered. Old Hopkins was an Englishman by birth and was restricted membership in the league only to Londoners people who live in London. Then I, too, hear that those with light red hair or dark red hair are rejected, and only those with real, bright, blazing, fiery red hair are accepted. Anyone has only to walk in to apply it, unless, of course, a few hundred pounds aren't that important to you. Of course you could qualify, boomed Dr. Watson. Your hair is red and rich enough to stand up under any competition. 
Yes, I thought so too, Dr. Watson, said Jabez Wilson. So I had Spalding close up the shop and come with me, since he seemed to know so much about the League. And when you got to the League's office, asked Holmes, the sight that greeted us on Fleet Street was almost unbelievable. From every direction, crowds of red-headed men filled the streets, many of every shade of red, some straw to orange to brick to liver, but there was not so many with real vivid flame-colored hair. When I saw the crowd waiting in Pope's court, I was ready to give up in despair. But Spalding wouldn't hear of it. Somehow he managed to push his way through the crowd until he led me right up to the steps to the office. A most interesting experience, said Holmes. Do go on. There was nothing in the office but a couple of wooden chairs and a card table, behind which sat a man with a, red, a head even redder than mine. He spoke a few words to the men on the line ahead of me and seemed to find fault with each one. When it came to my turn, he smiled at me and closed the door. This is Mr. Jabez Wilson, said Spaulding. He wishes, wishes to fill the opening in the league. He seems well suited for it, said the man. I cannot recall ever seeing such a fine head of red hair. Then he suddenly stepped forward. He shook my hand and congratulated me. Then he dropped my hands and said, I hope, dear sir, that you will forgive me for what I'm about to do, but I must make absolutely certain. And he seized my hair in both my hands and tugged until I yelled with pain. When he finally let go, there were tears in my eyes, but he calmly explained that we have to be careful, for twice we have been deceived by wigs and by paint. Then he stepped over to the window and shouted at the top of his voice that the vacancy had been filled. A groan of disappointment came from the crowd below, and they all began to troop away in different directions. Then the red-headed man turned to me and said, I am Duncan Ross of the League, and I'll need to ask some questions. First, are you a married man? Do you have a family? When I told him no, his face fell. Dear me, he said sadly, that is very serious indeed. The League is most anxious for its members to have children who can carry on their red hair. My face dropped in disappointment, Mr. Holmes, but ever after several minutes, Ross said it would be all right. He would make an exception because he was so taken with my red hair. Then he asked when I'd be able to be in my duties with the League. But I already have a business, I told him. Oh, never mind that, Mr. Wilson, cried Vincent Spaulding. I'll look after that for you. What would be the hours, I asked Ross. You must be at this office from 10 to 2 every day without leaving. If you set foot outside this building during your work time, you lose the job forever, Mr. Hopkins. It will be very clear on that point. That, Mr. Holmes, sounded quite good, for my, I conduct my pawnbroker's business mostly in the evening. Besides, I knew that Spaulding was a good man, and I would do just as he promised, or sorry, and would do just as he promised. So I agreed for the hours with Ross, and then asked him for pay. Four pounds a week, said Ross. In the work I am to do, I asked. You will copy the Encyclopedia Britannica page by page. The first volume is in that closet. You must provide your own ink, pens, and paper, but we provide this table and chair. Can you start tomorrow? Weird work. Why would you want someone to copy an encyclopedia? Agreed, Mr. Holmes, said Spaulding. Um, wait a second. Um, oh, I agreed, Mr. Holmes, and Spaulding, and I returned home, both of us pleased with my good fortune. For several hours, I was elated. Then my spirits dropped, and I persuaded myself that this had to be some kind of joke or fraud that someone was playing on me. But I could not figure out why. It seemed unbelievable that anyone would make up a will, leaving all that money to people for doing something as simple as copying the Encyclopedia Britannica. But with Spaulding's encouragement and my curiosity aroused, I set off for Pope's Court the next morning, carrying a penny p bottle of ink, a quill pen, and several sheets of paper. To my surprise, Everything was ready, and Mr. Duncan Ross was there to see that I got right to work. He gave me the A volume of the encyclopedia, because they go A, B, C, D, in alphabetical order, and then left. But he dropped in from time to time to see that everything was all right. At 2 o'clock, he said goodbye and complimented me on the number of pages I had written. This day went on, sorry, this went on day after day. Mr. Holmes, and on Saturday, Mr. Ross came in and handed me four gold sovereigns for my week's work. This went on week after week for eight weeks. The only change being Ross stopped and less and less as I worked until he stopped coming at all. Still, I didn't dare leave the office for fear of losing the job. 
During those eight weeks, I wrote about abbots and archery and armor and architecture and was nearly ready for the B volume, when suddenly the whole business came to an end. To an end? asked Holmes. Yes, sir. Just this morning I went to work as usual at ten o'clock, but the office door was shut and locked. A little square of cardboard was nailed to onto the door. Here it is. Jabez Wilson held up the cardboard as Dr. Watson read. The Red-Headed League is dissolved October 9, 1890. Here's a picture that goes with it. Very strange that he would be part of a league and then they would just quit like that. I wonder why it would just stop so suddenly. Holmes immediately burst out laughing. I don't see anything funny, cried Mr. Wilson, his face reddening almost to the color of his hair. If you can't do anything better than laugh at me, I'll take my business elsewhere. No, no, cried Holmes, shoving Jabez Wilson back in the chair from which he had half risen. I wouldn't miss your case for the world, but you must admit there is something a little funny about it. But tell me, what did you do next? I was shocked, sir. I didn't know what to do. I checked at the other offices in the court, but no one knew anything. Then I went to the landlord to inquire about Duncan Ross and the Red-Headed League, but the man said he had never heard of any such names. It's the gentleman at number four, I told him. Oh, the red-headed man, he said. Why, his name is William Morris. He told me he was a lawyer and was renting my rooms until his new office was ready. That's odd. Why would he say one thing and then another? He moved out only yesterday to his new office. In fact, he even told me it was at 17 King Edward Street. Naturally, I went directly to that office and that address, Mr. Holmes, but the only business at that address is a manufacturer of artificial kneecaps and no one there had ever heard of either William Morris or Duncan Ross. And what did you do then, Mr. Wilson? asked Holmes. I went home and talked this over with Vincent Spaulding. He advised me to wait, and that I'd surely hear something by mail, but that wasn't good enough for me. I didn't want to lose such a good job, so I came to you. That was wise of you, said Holmes. I am most interested in your case, for I believe that it is more serious than it first appears. Serious enough, cried Jabez Wilson. Four pounds a week is serious. I can't really see how you can complain about the leagues at Holmes. After all, you are richer by over 30 pounds from it, to say nothing of the knowledge you have gained on every subject under the letter A. <laughs> yeah, that's probably something funny that he would say. You've learned everything under the letter A. Uh, but I do want to find out about them, Mr. Holmes. Who are they and why they played this prank on me? We shall try to solve this mystery for you, Mr. Wilson, said Holmes, but first, one or two questions. Your assistant, Mr. Spaulding, the fellow who first called your attention to the ad, how long had he been with you before this? A month at the time of the ad. And how did he come to you? I advertised for an assistant, got a dozen applicants too. And why did you pick Spaulding? He seemed bright and was willing to work as cheap as I told you. Yes, half wages, muttered Holmes. I mean, tell me, Mr. Wilson, what does this Vincent Spaulding look like? Small, well-built, very quick in his movements, a white splash of acid on his forehead, but with a face so smooth that he never has to shave, even though he's more than 30 years old. Sherlock Holmes sat forward in his chair excitedly. I thought so, he cried. Tell me, Mr. Wilson, are his ears pierced for earrings? Why, yes, sir, he told me a gypsy did it when he was a boy. And this Spaulding, is he still with you? Yes, I left him only a while ago. That will do, Mr. Wilson, said Holmes, rising. Today is Saturday. I hope to have this mystery solved by Monday. Once Jabez Wilson had gone, Holmes turned to Watson and asked, Well, Watson, what do you make of it all? I make nothing, said Watson. It is a mystery to me. What do you plan to do? Smoke, answered Holmes. So back then, obviously, remember, they didn't know that smoking was uh, bad for you. So um, Sherlock Holmes is well known for having like one of those big pipes that he smokes while he's like thinking on cases. But don't smoke, guys. It's bad for you. Uh, let's see. Smoke, answered Holmes, curling up in his chair with his knee drawn up to his uh, hawk-like nose, his eyes tightly closed, and his black clay pipe clamped between his teeth. Please do not speak to me for 15 minutes. After a while, when Watson was almost certain that Holmes had dropped off to sleep, the detective suddenly sprang out of his chair. Watson, he cried, can your patience spare you for a few hours? I'd like you to go to a concert with me this afternoon. 
I'm free today, of course, Holmes, but what about... Come, come, snapped Holmes impatiently. I want to stop in the city first. So Holmes is kind of a... I mean, uh, yeah, Sherlock Holmes is kind of a eccentric, odd kind of a guy. Holmes and Watson travel by the underground, or like the subway, and then on foot to Coburg Square, excuse me, where Jabez Wilson had his business. The square was formed by lines of dingy two-story brick houses, which looked out onto a lawn of weedy grass and a few clumps of bushes. On a corner, a house, three gold balls, and a brown sign with Jabez Wilson in white letters that identified the pawnbroker's shop. This is probably going to be the last page for today. Holmes stopped in front of the building and looked it over, his eyes shining brightly. Then he walked slowly up the street and then down again to the corner, still looking intently at the houses. Then he returned to the front of Wilson's house. He thumped vigorously on the pavement with his walking stick. That's odd. Then he went to the door and knocked. The door was opened by a bright-looking, clean-shaven young fellow who invited Holmes and Watson in. Thank you, said Holmes. I only wanted to ask directions to the Strand. Third right, then fourth left, said Spaulding, and he quickly closed the door. Smart fellow he is, said Holmes, and he and Watson walked slowly away. He is, in fact, the fourth smartest man in London, and as for daring, I'd say third. I've heard of Vincent Spaulding before. Then he has something to do with the Red-Headed League, asked Watson. Yes. Um, and you asked directions of him merely to see what he looks like? Not him, said Holmes, rather the knees of his trousers. And I saw exactly what I expected. And why did you tap on the pavement? That will come later, my dear Watson. For now, I wish to explore the streets behind Coburg Square. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Um, and here is a picture they gave us of Holmes talking with Vincent Spaulding. You can see right there he's got dirt on his knees. So he's got to be doing something on his knees in dirt. All right, so I don't know. Uh, what's, let's see what's going on. We've got a red-headed league that was formed and disformed. An interesting guy working for someone for half price. And apparently some mystery that needs to be solved. So we, we are going to finish this up um, tomorrow. So hopefully you will tune in and figure out what the mystery of the Red Head League is.